Introduction The first section in our course is Introduction to Six Sigma. Before we move on, it is important to get ourselves introduced with this concept. Six Sigma is not a completely new way to manage an enterprise, but it is a very different way. In essence, Six Sigma forces change to occur in a systematic way. Six Sigma started as a problem-solving approach to reduce variation in a product and manufacturing environment. Variation means that a process does not produce the same result every time. Please note that Six Sigma is not about quality in the traditional sense. Quality, defined traditionally as conformance to internal requirements, has little to do with Six Sigma. Six Sigma is about helping organizations make more money by improving customer value and efficiency. To link this objective of Six Sigma with quality, we'll need to look at a new definition of quality. For Six Sigma purposes, quality is defined as the value added by a productive endeavor. Have a look as to how the process of Six Sigma works. Six Sigma begins by identifying the needs of the customer. These needs generally fall under the categories of timely delivery, competitive pricing, and zero defect quality. The customer's needs are then internalized as performance metrics, e.g. cycle time, defect rate, etc. Target performance levels are established, and the company then seeks to perform around these targets with minimal variation. Let's go through the agenda briefly. In this section, we will talk about the overall background of Six Sigma. The presentation will take you through the basics of Six Sigma, wherein we will talk about what Six Sigma actually is, plus the approach that it adopts to ensure continuous improvement. The history of Six Sigma, which mainly talks about the time when Six Sigma was branded at Motorola and later on adopted by GE to reap huge benefits. DMAIC Improvement Framework Just for your quick reference, DMAIC stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. We'll talk more about it later. A very important class of statistical distribution, i.e. normal distribution. It is the most important concept in statistics. It occurs in many natural phenomena, such as height, blood pressure, etc. Of course, we are not going to talk about height and blood pressure here. We will learn this theory briefly in terms of 3 and 6 standard deviation of 6 sigma, and how does this principle work. During this lecture, I introduced the 6 sigma briefly and showed the agenda of the course. During the next lecture, I will be describing the basics of 6 sigma. The Basics of Six Sigma This theory would help you build the foundation of Six Sigma in terms of gaining basic knowledge about the concept. Six Sigma is a highly disciplined process that focuses on developing and delivering near-perfect products and services consistently. It is a statistical concept that measures a process in terms of defects. The term Sigma is used to designate the distribution about the average of any process. In statistics, sigma is the symbol to depict population standard deviation. Six sigma is a continuous improvement process. The reason why it is referred to as a continuous improvement process is because it provides businesses a structured approach for analyzing how they are currently performing and how they can improve their processes to do the job efficiently and effectively on an ongoing basis. Remember people, Efficiency is all about productivity, and effectiveness is all about the quality of your work. An integral ingredient of Six Sigma is a process-centric view. Before we talk more about it, let's try to understand what it means by a process. A process is a series of steps designed to produce a product or service, as specified by the customer. That's it, guys. A process-centric view simply means understanding the combination of what and how inputs come together to produce the final output. Please note that a product is the result of a process, and a process is the cause for producing a product. Let's visualize it to make you better understand. 
Man, material, machine, management, etc. Create a cause. These are actually inputs for the processes. Based on these inputs, processes generate outputs, and these outputs are used as feedback to improve the future outputs as well. Processes produce products or services. A common feature of any such process, as shown, emphasis on inputs and outputs. Input is something put into a process or expended in its operation to achieve an output or a result. Output is the final product or service delivered to an internal or external customer, and outputs of a process can be inputs to another process. During this lecture, I describe the basics of Six Sigma and what a process is. During the next lecture, I will be describing the definition of sigma. Definition of Sigma. Literally speaking, the 18th letter in the Greek alphabet, sigma, is the symbol for standard deviation. The standard deviation is a measure of how spread out numbers are. In other words, it is one of the measures of dispersion, or you can call it as variation. Six sigma is a structured methodology to measure the quality of your service and performance. Its methodology is based on established statistical process control or SPC techniques, data analysis methods, and systematic training of all personnel involved in the activity or process targeted by the program. The term Six Sigma defines an optimum measurement of quality: 3.4 defects per million opportunities. In other words, 3.4 defects in 10 lakh opportunities. Are we aware what does it mean by the word opportunity? Let me quote it in simple words: An opportunity means the chance to commit an error. It signifies that the accuracy level Six Sigma seeks to achieve is 99.9997 percent. Let's say it this way: The DPMO of 3.4 is 99.9997 percent accuracy. We will be going over the concept of DPMO in detail in our further lectures. During this lecture, I describe the definition of sigma. During the next lecture, I will be describing what is six sigma. We have seen in our previous lecture the description of the sigma, but what is six sigma? Now let's talk about the salient features of six sigma. Six sigma is a rigorous and highly disciplined business improvement process adopted by companies to help focus on developing and delivering near-perfect products and services. Michael Harry, president and CEO of Six Sigma Academy, defines it as. A business process that allows companies to drastically improve their bottom line by designing and monitoring everyday business activities in ways that minimize waste and resources while increasing customer satisfaction. Therefore, Six Sigma is a customer-focused business improvement process. The success of any Six Sigma project is based on team efforts, right from top to bottom. It's very important that Six Sigma team leaders at all levels know something about the workings and evolution of teams. Six Sigma approach to problem solving is completely data driven and based on statistical tools. That is why it is said to be driven by logical reasoning. We've spoken about it already. Just to reiterate, DMAIC stands for Define, Measure. Analyze, improve, and control. It is the foundation of Six Sigma. The DMAIC is the classic problem-solving process. DMAIC resolves issues of defects or failures, deviation from a target, excess cost or time. DMAIC addresses improvements in productivity: how many, financial, how much money, quality, how well, and time, how fast. PFQT. 
y equals f of x. This equation represents the mechanism and approach of six sigma. It is a core six sigma formula. Typically, y is referred to as the output, x as the input, and the process that produces the output is referred to as f of x. It is read as y is the function of single or multiple x's. At this stage, please remember that measuring x's and y's is not an end in itself. X's have to be connected or related to y's. Take a look at a few examples. For instance, if x is the cycle time, then y might be on time delivery. Or, if x is the quality of work done, then y might be the level of customer satisfaction. Briefly, Six Sigma focuses on making the process robust and reducing variability. One of the most important aspects of Six Sigma is applies to any process. Yes, you've got it right. Six Sigma applies to any process, irrespective of the industry, company, and or domain you are associated with. During this lecture, I described what Six Sigma is. During the next lecture, I will be describing the Six Sigma approach. Six Sigma Approach Let's see what Six Sigma Approach or thinking is. Please note the DMAIC methodology of Six Sigma states that all processes can be defined, measured, analyzed, improved, and controlled. These are the phases of Six Sigma. Collectively, it is called as DMAIC. Any process which has inputs X and delivers outputs Y comes under the purview of Six Sigma approach. X may represent input, cause, or problem and Y may represent output, effect, or symptom. We can say here that controlling inputs will control output, because the output Y will be generated based on the inputs X. This approach is called as Y equals FX thinking. It is the mechanism of Six Sigma. As per Six Sigma approach, every problematic situation has to be converted into this kind of equation, because make a note here, it's not a rocket science, but it is just a new way of looking at the problem. Please remember that the context of relating X and Y to each other would vary from situation to situation. If X is your input, then only Y becomes your output. If X is your cause, Y will not be regarded as the output. If X is your input, Y cannot be called as an effect. Let's go further. The equation of y equals fx could involve several subordinate outputs, perhaps as leading indicators of the overall big Y. For example, if TAT was identified as the big Y, the improvement team may examine leading indicators, such as cycle time and lead time, as little y's. Each subordinate Y may flow down into its own y equals fx relationship wherein some of the critical variables for one also may affect another little y. That another little variable could be your potential x or critical x. In Six Sigma approach, the practical problem is the problem or pain area which has been persisting on your production or shop floor. As per Six Sigma approach, you will need to convert this practical problem into statistical problem. Statistical problem is the problem that is addressed with facts and data analysis methods. Just to keep you all posted, the measurement and analysis of a statistical problem is completed in measure and analyze phase of Six Sigma, DMAIC. The statistical problem will then be converted into statistical solution. It is the solution with known confidence or risk levels versus an I think solution. This solution is not based on gut feeling, it's a completely data-driven solution. A Six Sigma DMAIC project would assist you to convert your practical problem into statistical problem, and then your statistical problem into statistical solution. The same project would also give you practical solutions that aren't complex and too difficult to implement. 
That's how the Six Sigma approach works. During this lecture, I described the Six Sigma approach. During the next lecture, I will be describing Six Sigma as a measure. Six Sigma as a measure. Now, we will compare a 99% yield less than four sigma to a six sigma yield of nearly 100% quality. Then, consider for a moment the potential lost profit in your company that is probably operating at two to three sigma. Please try to understand the message here. The message says that Six Sigma forces organizations to pursue perfection by asking if 99% acceptability is good enough. If it's really good, then the companies need to go through this table. Let's give examples from real life to these quality levels to illustrate the concepts better in your mind. 3.8 Sigma corresponds to 20,000 lost articles of mail per hour while Six Sigma corresponds to seven articles lost per hour. 3.8 Sigma corresponds to unsafe drinking water for almost 15 minutes each day. Six Sigma corresponds to one unsafe minute every seven months. 3.8 Sigma corresponds to 5,000 incorrect surgical operations per week. Six Sigma corresponds to 1.7 incorrect operations per week. 3.8 Sigma corresponds to two short or long landings at most major airports every day. Six Sigma corresponds to one short or long landing every five years. 3.8 Sigma corresponds to 20,000 wrong drug prescriptions each year. Six Sigma corresponds to 68 wrong prescriptions per year. And the last example is, 3.8 Sigma corresponds to no electricity for almost seven hours each month. Six Sigma corresponds to one hour without electricity every 34 years. These examples are self-explanatory. You should have got the insights of quality levels of different Sigma levels and how Six Sigma aims to reach perfection. Please note here, that while Six Sigma corresponds to being 99.9997% defect free, not all business processes need to attain this higher goal. Companies can also use the Six Sigma methodology to identify which of their key business processes would benefit most from improvement and then focus their improvement efforts there. It clearly means that the Sigma level requirement for every process or vertical would always vary. Of course, there would always be an area for improvement because process improvement is an ongoing process. It's not a one-time activity. Your process or vertical owners will take a call what kind of sigma level does their process require or what is actually good to their process. During this lecture, I described Six Sigma as a measure and provided examples from real life for different sigma levels. During the next lecture, I'll be describing why Six Sigma. Why do we need Six Sigma? Six Sigma is a disciplined and data-driven approach. That is why decisions taken with the help of Six Sigma tools and techniques are based on facts figures, and the relevant data. These decisions are never based on gut feeling or any personal opinion. Six Sigma methodology attacks high-hanging fruits. High-hanging fruits are nothing but the complex problems or hard stuff. Six Sigma addresses complex or critical pain areas first. It eliminates chronic problems in your process. Chronic means of long duration or lasted for a long period. Once the chronic problem is eliminated, it improves customer satisfaction. The customer could be your internal or external customers, depending on the setup you are engaged into. Six Sigma is a disciplined approach to problem solving. Please note here that Six Sigma is not a new way, but a different way to address and solve problems. As a result, it does help to change the working culture in an organization. 
These are the major benefits of Six Sigma. There are lots of other benefits that cannot be limited into a slide here. During this lecture, I described why we need Six Sigma and major benefits of Six Sigma. During the next lecture, I will be describing the history of Six Sigma. History of Six Sigma The history of Six Sigma at Motorola can be summarized as follows. In the late 1970s, Motorola started experimenting with problem solving through statistical analysis. In the 1980s, Motorola CEO Bob Galvin was struggling to compete with foreign manufacturers when senior sales vice president Art Sundry admitted that our quality stinks. Quality engineer Bill Smith coined the improvement measurements as Six Sigma. The term Six Sigma was coined by Bill Smith in Motorola. Now Bill Smith is called as the father of Six Sigma around the world. Motorola increased the measurement scale of defects to parts per million, which prompted the use of the Six Sigma terminology. Motorola branded Six Sigma. In 1987, Motorola officially launched its Six Sigma program. Motorola initiated Six Sigma for process improvement, thereby reducing defects to negligible levels. With the help of this program, Motorola saved $17 billion from 1986 to 2004, reflecting hundreds of individual successes in the business areas like sales and marketing, customer service, transactional processes, and product design. Another company that had the great benefit of Six Sigma is General Electric, and the Six Sigma initiative of GE was famous Jack Welch. The history of Six Sigma at GE can be summarized as follows. Jack Welch launched Six Sigma at GE in January 1996. It was at GE that Six Sigma was used to improve the entire business system. GE saved $750 million by the end of 1998. GE could cut invoice defects and disputes by 98%, speeding payment and creating better productivity. They also streamlined contract review process, leading to faster completion of deals and annual savings of $1 million. In 1998 and 1999, Six Sigma Greenbelt exam became the criteria for management promotions. Terms such as black belt and green belt were coined by Mikhail Harry in relation to martial arts and in today's world. Six Sigma Green Belt and Black Belt certifications have great credibility in all industries. During this lecture, we described how Six Sigma term first initiated, evolved, and how Motorola and GE used Six Sigma to increase their quality and ensured cost saving. During the next lecture, we will be seeing Six Sigma projects and organizational goals. Six Sigma Projects and Organizational Goals In a Six Sigma project, members of an organization are assigned specific roles to play. This highly structured format is necessary in order to implement Six Sigma throughout the organization. Any Six Sigma project will not necessarily bring improvements to a business. Six Sigma projects should be aligned to the goals of a business system or organizational goals. Six Sigma projects must align to the organizational goals short and long term. Based on the organization's goals, project selection is done. Project selection group, consisting of master black belts, black belts, champions, and key executives, establish a set of criteria for project selection and team assignments. Team selection for the project may be done based on the nature of the project. If the project has extensive data analysis, it may be given to a Six Sigma team, whereas if the project is about establishing a necessary quality standard, 
it may be given to a quality assurance team. Design of new products or process should follow the DFSS roadmap. It helps in assigning financial metrics to the outcome of the project during its selection phase. Examples of financial metrics would include return on investment or ROI, increase in profit, cost reduction, and so on. Calculating the profit expected out of the project helps in further selection of the project. Expected profit equals the sum of profit times probability of success. Projects for selection should also conform to the whole system. The effect of proposed changes on other processes within the system should be considered. Improvement in any of one process of a business system should not reduce optimization of the other processes in the system. Now, let's see responsibilities in a Six Sigma project. There are seven responsibilities in a Six Sigma project. We will be going over each one by one. 1. Leadership A leadership team or council defines the goals and objectives in the Six Sigma process. Just as a corporate leader sets a tone and course to achieve an objective, the Six Sigma Council sets out the goals to be met by the team. Here is the list of leadership council responsibilities. A. Define the purpose of the Six Sigma program. B. Explain how the result is going to benefit the customer. C. Set a schedule for work and interim deadlines. D. Develop a means for review and oversight. And E. Support team members and defend established positions. 2. Sponsor Six Sigma sponsors are high-level individuals who understand Six Sigma and are committed to its success. The individual in the sponsor role acts as a problem solver for the ongoing Six Sigma project. Six Sigma will be led by a full-time high-level champion, such as an executive vice president. Sponsors are owners of processes and systems who help initiate and coordinate Six Sigma improvement activities in their areas of responsibilities. 3. Implementation Leader The person responsible for supervising the Six Sigma team effort who supports the leadership council by ensuring that the work of the team is completed in the desired manner. Implementation leader ensures success of the implementation plan and solves problems as they arise, organizes training as needed, and assists sponsors in motivating the team. 4. Coach The Six Sigma expert or consultant who sets a schedule defines results of a project and who mediates conflicts or deals with resistance to the program. Duties include working as go-between for sponsor and leadership, scheduling the work of the team, identifying and defining desired results of the project, mediating disagreements, conflicts, and resistance to the program at identifying success as it occurs. 5. Team Leader the individual responsible for overseeing the work of the team and for acting as go-between with the sponsor and the team members. Responsibilities include communication with the sponsor in defining project goals and rationale, picking and assisting team members and other resources, keeping the project on schedule, and keeping track of steps in the process as they are completed. 6. Team Member an employee who works on a Six Sigma project, given specific duties within a project and deadlines to meet in reaching specific project goals. The team members execute specific Six Sigma assignments and work with other members of the team within a defined project schedule to reach specifically identified goals. And 7. Process Owner the individual who takes on responsibility for a process after a Six Sigma team has completed its work. During this lecture, we have seen Six Sigma projects and organizational goals. We've seen how a project is selected and responsibilities within a Six Sigma project. During the next lecture, we will be going over process for Six Sigma.
Process for Six Sigma The Process for Six Sigma is abbreviated as DMAIC, and each letter in this abbreviation corresponds to a phase. D stands for Define, M stands for Measure, A stands for Analyze, I stands for Improve, and C stands for Control. The advantage of the DMAIC approach is not the top-level phases themselves, but what is contained in each phase. The contents provide a common and structured approach to solving a problem. For each phase, there are some primary activities. Let's have a look at it. The first phase is Define. This phase claims to define the problem statement and plan the improvement initiative. This phase is all about defining the problem and the goals of the improvement activity. The most important goals are obtained from the customer. The description of the problem should include the pain felt by the customer and or business, as well as how long the issue has existed. In this phase, the team answers the question, what is important to the business? The second phase is measure. This phase aims to collect data from the process and understand current quality level. The team measures the existing system in this stage by establishing valid and reliable metrics to help monitor progress towards the goal defined in the previous step. In other words, the team identifies what data is available and from what source. They develop a plan to gather it, do the actual data collection and summarize it. In this phase, the team answers the question, how are we doing with the current process? The third phase is Analyze. This phase aims to study the business process and the data generated to understand the root causes of the problem. In this phase, the team analyzes the process to identify ways to eliminate the gap between the current performance and the desired goal. The team uses statistical data analysis techniques to arrive at validated root causes of the problem. In this phase, the team answers the question, what is wrong with the current process? The fourth phase is improve. This phase aims to identify possible improvement actions, prioritize them, test the environments, and finalize the improvement action plan. This phase is all about proposing and selecting a solution to improve the system. This is the stage where the team has to become creative enough in finding new ways to do things better, cheaper, or faster. Based on the identified root causes, the team directly addresses the causes with an improvement. In this phase, the team answers the question, what needs to be done to improve the process? The fifth and the last phase is Control. This phase aims to ensure the full-scale implementation of Improvement Action Plan, set up controls to monitor the system so that gains are sustained. In this phase, the team implements the solution and transfers the ownership of the new improved process to the responsible owner. The team put a control plan in place to monitor ongoing performance. They use statistical tools to monitor stability of the new process. During this lecture, we have seen the five phases of Six Sigma and what each phase aims to do respectively. During the next lecture, we will be seeing what the lean is. If you were quite interested in quality management or Six Sigma previously, you should have heard about Lean or Lean Six Sigma. But what is Lean? Lean was started by Taichi Ono at Toyota. It is also known as the Toyota Production System. Lean derives its methodology from the Toyota Production System. Lean is a principle-driven, tool-based philosophy that focuses on eliminating waste so that all activities and steps add value from the customer's perspective. Six Sigma is aimed at reducing the variability, as we discussed earlier. However, Lean aims to reduce waste. Lean thinking is all about continuous waste elimination. The waste is called as muda in Japanese, which also means non-value-added activities. 
There are eight types of wastes, or MUDA, or NVAs in Lean, which are as follows. Motion, waiting, overproduction, unutilized talent, overprocessing, defects, inventory, and transportation. And the Lean aims to reduce these wastes. Lean is a strategy and process for operating in a superior way. If we illustrate the Lean in a figure, it would be as the following. Lean aims to reduce cost, defects, lead time, inventory, space, and waste. This means relentless focus on reducing non-value-adding activities, and by this way, increase in the productivity, customer satisfaction, profit, customer responsiveness, capacity, quality, cash flow, and on-time delivery. During this lecture, we have seen what the lean is and how it eliminates waste. During the next lecture, we will be going over the lean toolkit. Lean Toolkit The Lean Toolkit offers practical tools and techniques that can help Lean and other specialists on the shop floor to deliver Lean decisions as a routine task of their Lean-driven business operations. This toolkit has been divided into two levels. The first level is targeted at exposing the waste. To expose the waste, it takes help of five tools, i.e. 5S, MUDA, Mistake Proofing, Value Stream Mapping or VSM, and Visual Management. The second level is targeted at reducing the variability to control the process. To reduce variability, it takes help of four tools, i.e. VSM, Standardized Work, Introduction to Continuous Flow, and Introduction to Poll Production. Over time, as the organization reaches to a more mature level, Waste is expected to be minimized. After minimization of the waste and reaching a more mature level as an organization, reducing the variability and controlling the process is aimed at the second level. During this lecture, we have seen the Lean Toolkit. During the next lecture, we will be going over Lean Techniques. Lean Techniques We will be going over eight different Lean Techniques during this lecture. 1. Kaizen The purpose of Kaizen is to improve work processes in a variety of ways. Kaizen is a generic Japanese word for improvement or making things better. Kaizen was created in Japan following World War II. The word Kaizen means continuous improvement. It comes from the Japanese words Kai, which means change, or to correct, and Zen, which means good. 2. Poker yoke. The purpose of poker yoke is to prevent the occurrence of mistakes or defects. It uses a wide variety of ingenious devices to prevent mistakes. An example is an automotive gasoline tank cap having an attachment that prevents the cap from being lost, also known as mistake proofing. Japanese approach to mistake proofing in all aspects of manufacturing, customer service, etc. It employs visual signals that make mistakes clearly stand out from the rest. Its older name is Baka Yoke, full proofing. 3. 5S The purpose of 5S is to reduce wasteful time and motion at a micro level. It is an organized approach to housekeeping that ensures tools, parts, and other objects are in known optimum locations. Actually, it is a framework to create and maintain your workplace. 5S stands for Sort, Set in Order, Shine, Standardize, and Sustain. 4. Kanban The purpose of Kanban is to schedule production and minimize work in process while encouraging improvement in many areas. Kanban establishes a small stock point, usually at the producing work center, that sends a signal when items are withdrawn by a downstream process. 
the producing work center replaces the items removed. Kanban literally means signboard or billboard in Japanese. Kanban utilizes visual display cards to signal movement of material between steps of a production process. It is a scheduling system for lean and just-in-time. Kanban was developed at Toyota to find a system to improve and maintain a high level of production. 5. Just-in-time It is simply a production strategy that strives to improve a business's return on investment, or ROI, by reducing in-process inventory and associated carrying costs. To meet GIT objectives, the process relies on signals or Kanban between different points in the process, which tells production when to make the next part. Just-in-time is actually a manufacturing philosophy, which leads to producing the necessary units in the necessary quantities at the necessary time with the required quality. 6. Jidoka The purpose of Jidoka is to prevent problems on one station of a production line from building inventory and also to create urgency to find permanent solutions. Jidoka is the practice of stopping an integrated assembly or production line when any workstation encounters problems. Such stoppages create a crisis atmosphere that encourages immediate and permanent solutions. Jidoka means automation with human touch. It implements supervisory function in the production line and stops the process as soon as a defect is encountered. The process does not start until the root cause of the defect has been eliminated. 7. Tact Time The purpose of tact time is to balance the output of sequential production processes and prevent inventory buildups and shortages. It is the average time required between output units at a particular process coordinated with final customer requirements. Tact time is a lean tool. It is the frequency at which a product or service must be completed in order to meet customer needs. The formula for tact time is Tack time equals available time over required output. 8. Hijunka Hijunka is the leveling of production by both volume and product mix. This system does not build products according to the actual flow of customer orders. Hijunka takes the total volume of orders in a period and levels them out so the same amount and mix are being made each day. It means production leveling and smoothing. It is a technique to reduce waste, which occurs due to fluctuating customer demand. During this lecture, we have gone over eight different lean techniques. During the next lecture, we will be going over lean principles. Lean principles. There are five fundamental principles of lean. Now, we will be going over each principle one by one. The first principle is identify customers and specify value. Specify value from the standpoint of the end customers by product family. The starting point is to recognize that only a small fraction of the total time and effort in any organization actually adds value for the end customer. By clearly defining value for a specific product or service from the end customer's perspective, all the non-value activities or waste can be targeted for removal. The second principle is identify and map the value stream. Identify all the steps in the value stream for each product family, eliminating whenever possible those steps that do not create value. The value stream is the entire set of activities across all parts of the organization involved in jointly delivering the product or service. This represents the end-to-end -end process that delivers the value to the customer. Once you understand what your customer wants, the next step is to identify how you are delivering or not that to them. The third principle is create flow by eliminating waste. Make the value-creating steps occur in tight sequence so the product will flow smoothly toward the customer. Typically, when you first map the value stream, you will find that only 5% of activities add value. This can rise to 45% in a service environment. 
Eliminating this waste ensures that your product or service flows to the customer without any interruption, detour, or waiting. The fourth principle is respond to customer pull. As flow is introduced, let customers pull value from the next upstream activity. This is about understanding the customer demand on your service and then creating your process to respond to this, such that you produce only what the customer wants when the customer wants it. The fifth and last principle is pursue perfection. As value is specified, value streams are identified, wasted steps are removed, and flow and pull are introduced. Begin the process again and continue it until a state of perfection is reached in which perfect value is created with no waste. Creating flow and pull starts with radically reorganizing individual process steps, but the gains become truly significant as all the steps link together. As this happens more and more, layers of waste become visible and the process continues towards the theoretical endpoint of perfection where every asset and every action adds value for the end customer. By following these five principles of Lean, you will implement a philosophy that will become just the way things are done. The diagram represents the cycle of Lean principles. It clearly indicates that Lean is a never-ending process, and that is why it is a continuous waste elimination process. During this lecture, we have seen the five principles of the Lean. During the next lecture, we will be going over structure of the Six Sigma team. Structure of the Six Sigma team. Let's have a look at the structure of a Six Sigma team. We would also try to understand their scope of duties in brief. Top executives of an organization or the leadership council consists of leaders in the business. These people lead change initiatives across the organization. This group plans and executes the Six Sigma implementation plan. In most organizations, a sponsor or a champion is the one who oversees a Six Sigma project and is accountable to the top executives for the success of that project. Six Sigma champions identify and scope the projects, develop deployment and strategy, support cultural change, identify, coach, and develop master black belts. Each champion has three to four reporting master black belts. Six Sigma master black belt is the Six Sigma coach, he provides expert advice to a number of process owners and Six Sigma improvement teams in areas ranging from statistical measurement tool to change management and process design strategies. Six Sigma master black belts train and coach black belts, green belts, and functional leaders. Each Six Sigma master black belt has three to four reporting black belts. The team leader, or black belt, is the person who accepts primary responsibility for the routine work and results of a Six Sigma project. The duties are similar to those of the coach, but specific to one team only. Black Belt supplies strategy to specific projects, leads and directs teams to execute projects. Green Belts are usually employees who have received enough Six Sigma training to participate in a team or in some companies, to work individually on a small-scale project directly related to their own job. Green belts support black belts by participating in project teams. During this lecture, we have seen the structure of a Six Sigma team. During the next lecture, we will be seeing the difference of two frameworks, DMAIC and DMADV. DMAIC versus DMADV. We have seen that DMAIC stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. Another improvement framework is DMADV, and the first three letters of this framework is the same as in DMAIC, and stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, respectively. 
However, the last two letters stand for design and verify. Each phase of the DMADV framework is as below. Define customer requirements and goals for the process, product or service. Measure and match performance to customer requirements. Analyze and assess the design for the process, product or service. Design and implement the array of new processes required for the new process, product or service. And verify results and maintain performance. The basic difference of DMAIC and DMADV frameworks is DMAIC will be used when you are trying to improve or develop a process which is already in existence. However, the DMADV, Define, Measure, Analyze, Design, Verify method, aims to redesign a problematic process or product. The approach initially follows the first three steps of DMAIC and then deviates in the last two steps by introducing design or redesign and verify or validate the steps to gain the improvements needed. This approach prevents problems from happening through quality and robust design concepts. This flowchart represents how DMADV and DMAIC frameworks differ from each other. As you see in the flowchart, after the define phase, based on the existence of the process, if it is an existing process, DMAIC framework is followed. If it is not an existing process, then DMADV framework is followed. During this lecture, we have seen the differences of DMAIC and DMADV framework. During the next lecture, we will be going over normal distribution curve. Normal distribution or bell curve. The term normal distribution curve or bell curve is used to describe the mathematical concept called normal distribution, sometimes referred to as Gaussian distribution. It refers to the shape that is created when a line is plotted using the data points for an item that meets the criteria of normal distribution. Many natural phenomena demonstrate a pattern called the normal distribution or bell curve. If you measure the height of women across the world, the results will follow a predictable form that resembles the shape of a bell. The temperature also follows this pattern. If you measure the average noon temperature for July days in the US each year, you would find that the observations followed a bell curve pattern. You could also try to measure the height of all of your colleagues at work, or the time they take to drink a cup of coffee and you will find an approximately standard bell curve. Let us also look at the structure of a bell curve. The center contains the greatest number of a value and therefore would be the highest point on the arc of the line. This point is the mean or average. In other words, it is the highest number of occurrences of an element. The same point is the mode. Please note that in the case of normal distributed data, the mean will be equal to both median and the mode. The normal distribution curve is concentrated in the center and decreases on either side. This is significant as the data has less of a tendency to produce unusually extreme values called outliers or special causes of variation or SCV as compared to other distributions. A normal distribution curve graph depends on two factors, the mean and the standard deviation. Please note that a standard normal distribution has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. The mean identifies the position of the center and the standard deviation determines the height and width of the bell. For example, a large standard deviation creates a flat and wide shaped bell, while a small standard deviation creates a narrow and steeper curve. The rule is simple. The flatter the curve, the higher the variation. The steeper the curve, the lower the variation. Let's go over an example. If you roll a single dice, possibility of each number to come is equal and around 16.67% for each number. If you roll two dices, the possibility of the sum of the dots will be as shown in the pink line. It will be from 2 to 12 respectively. But as you see, 
the possibility of getting the sum as 7 is the highest, which is actually 2 plus 12 divided by 2. And finally, if you roll 3 dice at the same time, the possibility of the sum of the dots will be as shown in the yellow line. Results will be ranging from 3 to 18, but as you see, the possibility of getting the sum as 10 or 11 are the highest, which is actually close to 10.5, and this if found by 3 plus 18 divided by 2. Now, I'm sure that you are aware of what standard deviation is. Just to reiterate, the standard deviation is a measure of how closely grouped or how widely spaced a set of data appears. It is one of the measures of dispersion. Now, let's also recall the empirical rule of standard deviation. It says in a standard normal distribution, 68% of the data points will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. 95% will fall within plus or minus two standard deviations. And 99.73% of the data points will fall within plus or minus three standard deviation from the mean. If we sum up what we learned about normal distribution curve, NDC is a probability distribution where the most frequently occurring value is in the middle and other probabilities tail off symmetrically in both directions. The curve theoretically does not reach zero. The curve can be divided in half with equal pieces falling either side of the most frequently occurring value. A normal curve indicates random or chance variation. The peak of the curve represents the center of the process. And normal distributions are divided up into three standard deviations on each side of the mean. During this lecture, we have seen the normal distribution, or in other words, bell curve. During the next lecture, we will be going over Six Sigma normal curve. Six Sigma normal curve. Now, Let's recall the empirical rule of standard deviation again. This slide talks about an extension to the same rule. The rule is, 68% of the data points will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. 95% of the observations will fall within plus or minus two standard deviations. And 99.73% of the data points will fall within plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean. Now, the extension would be as follows. 99.9937% of the data points will fall within plus or minus four standard deviation from the mean. 99.99994% of the data points will fall within plus or minus five standard deviation from the mean. And finally, 99.9999998% of the data points fall within plus or minus six standard deviation from the mean. This means in a Six Sigma project, 99.9999998% of the results must fall within plus or minus six standard deviation from the mean. In other words, only 0.0000002% of the results can be out of the expected results. I think this percentage tells enough how Six Sigma approaches to increase the quality in projects. During this lecture, I described the Six Sigma normal curve. During the next lecture, I will be describing specification limits. Specification limits. There are two specification limits. The first one is lower specification limit, abbreviated as LSL, and this is the highest acceptable limit as set by a customer. The second one is upper specification limit, abbreviated as USL, and this is the lowest acceptable limit as set by a customer. Note that these limits are generally given by the customer. That is why USL minus LSL equals voice of the customer, or VOC. 
Let's go over a sample graph to understand this concept better. The process spread in the above chart, which is plus or minus three standard deviation of the six sigma, is measured by the range, variance, and standard deviation. Please note here that specification spread, USL minus LSL, divided by the process spread, 6S, is known as short-term process capability, based on the dispersion of the sample data. The further the specification spread from the process spread, the higher would be the process capability. In other words, the lesser the variation, the higher would be the process capability. During this lecture, we have gone over the specification limits. During the next lecture, we will be going over acceptable versus defective. Acceptable versus defective. Before we move on, let's try to understand the difference between defects and defectives. It means failing to deliver what the customer wants. Defective means the failing of the entire product or service. Please remember, one defective product may have multiple number of defects, but an existence of a defect does not necessarily mean the product is defective. As we know, the center of the process can be measured in three ways, mean, median, and mode. In case of a process which is shifted off target, the mean gets shifted towards the USL. The data distribution is termed as negatively skewed, wherein the left tail becomes longer, and the mass of the distribution is concentrated on the right of the figure. Large variation is noticed when the normal distribution curve is flatter in shape. In this case, the specification spread becomes smaller than the process spread. It reduces the short-term process capability. The centered process has normally distributed data. It is the on-target process. In this case, the distribution is symmetric, has close to zero skewness, and the specification spread is more than the process spread. During this lecture, we have seen acceptable versus defective. During the next lecture, we will be going over Design for Six Sigma, or DFSS. Design for Six Sigma. Let's now talk about DFSS approach to designing a process. DFSS is an approach to designing or redesigning product and or services to meet or exceed customer requirements and expectations. DFSS is an enhancement to your new product development process, not a replacement for it. A documented, well understood and useful new product development process is fundamental to a successful DFSS program. What can be designed? A new product or service. A new process for a new product or service. A redesign of existing product or service to meet customer requirement. Or a redesign of existing product or service process. DFSS ensures that the product or service meets customer requirement and that the process of this product or service is already at Six Sigma level. The intention of DFSS is to bring such new products and or services to market with a process performance of around 4.5 sigma or better, for every customer requirement. This implies an ability to understand the customer's needs and to design and implement the new offering with a reliability of delivery before launch rather than after. DFSS is an approach and attitude towards delivering new products and services with a high performance, as measured by customers' critical to quality metrics. Just as the Six Sigma approach has the DMAIC methodology, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, by which processes can be improved, DFSS also has a methodology, by which new products and services can be designed and implemented. DFSS has many approaches, like DMADV, Design, Measure, Analyze, Design and Verify, and IDOV, Identify, Design, 
optimize and verify. What DFSS means to a business system? Introduce new product or service or new category of product or service. New category for the business system and not the customer. Improve product or service. Addition to current product or service lines. During this lecture, we have seen the design for Six Sigma. During the next lecture, we will be summarizing what we have seen during this section. Summary of the section During this section, we have seen the basics of Six Sigma, the definition of Six Sigma, and the Six Sigma approach. We have seen how high quality is aimed with the Six Sigma in organizations. Then we have gone through the history of Six Sigma and how much it helped to save in Motorola and General Electric. After going through the structure of Six Sigma projects and structure of Six Sigma project teams, we have defined the famous framework of Six Sigma, DMAIC. Then we went through the Lean, Lean Toolkit, Lean Techniques and Lean Principles. We learned that the Lean philosophy mainly aims to eliminate any kind of waste. Through the last lectures of the section, we went through the normal distribution curve and its analogy with the Six Sigma. After that, we saw how customers define the acceptable limits for a process. To sum up, Six Sigma is about creating a culture that demands perfection and that gives employees the tools to enable them to pinpoint performance gaps and make the necessary improvements. Six Sigma does make use of full range of statistical tools that are available for analyzing and solving problems. And the primary objective of Six Sigma is to reduce variability. Please note that variability is the primary sign of defects. Hence, as the variation reduces, the number of defects also comes down. Now, you are familiar with Lean and Six Sigma and its fundamentals. I hope you enjoyed this section. Please feel free to post any questions in the discussion forum or send us a message. We will be happy to help you.